The Agenda is powered by DART, Delaware's transit service, moving forward. Hello, this is Kerwin Gaines and welcome back to the agenda. As promised, we are making sure that your rights, the things that are important to you, stay on the agenda. We're going to bring you that information. Uh, we're dedicated here at DETV to do that, um, not just because Ivan tells me to, but because it's important to you. And today is no exception. We are here with Mr. Jeff Haig, the president of Delaware Sportsman. Delaware State Sportsman, yes, thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's first time guest. We're always, you know, excited that we're having first time guests and we hope you come back. And Miss Shana Shanaya. Shanaya. Shanaya Daniels. Yes. And which organization are you with again? The National African American Gun Association. So it's a great show. Uh, we're going to talk about your rights um, as a gun owner, as we know, and as we talked about on this show, um, I, I too am a gun owner. Um, I and enjoy weapons. Um, I'm going to be hunting for the first time this year. Um, I, I am a proponent, but I am not biased. I understand that there, it is just not as easy as owning a weapon. I understand that um, in Delaware we have several issues in regards to who is owning those weapons, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. So thank you for joining in, and we're going to start with you. Uh, President Haig, <laughs> thank you for joining the show. And again, thank we're you. talking about uh, Senate Bill Number Two, Zero Zero Two. That's that's currently going through, and and I think it's causing you a little bit of agenda. Yes, it is. Uh, thanks again for having me on. Um, Senate Bill Senate Substitute One for Senate Bill Two was is the third time in the last five years that this policy has been introduced, and its the short name is Permit to Purchase. And what it entails is requiring someone who wishes to purchase a handgun that they go through several steps before they're allowed to do that. They have to complete a course of instruction, which consists of about nine or ten items, which is essentially the same as if you wanted to purchase or get a concealed carry permit. Then you have to make an application to the State Department of Homeland Security. You have to submit the fingerprints. They, in turn, do a background check. Um, and then there's, there's a determination made by the Secretary of Homeland Security as to whether or not you're going to be permitted to get this permit, which in the latest bill was good for one year. So there's, you need to go through all these steps before you're allowed to purchase a handgun. And it doesn't apply to long guns or shotguns, but it applies only to handguns. The permit's good for one year. Uh, after that, you have to go through the steps again. You don't have to get the training again. However, you do make, have to make application to the Department of Homeland Security and get their approval. So on many facets, we disagree with the concept and the policy. Uh, bottom line is we don't think it, it will do anything to reduce the number of violent crimes committed with firearms, murders or suicides, which is what they claim, which is what the proponents claim. We don't believe that it'll do that. Mm -hmm. We think it focuses on the wrong thing. Uh, it focuses on the object, in this case a firearm, rather than the person that's committing the violent act. We feel that the emphasis needs to be placed on that aspect of any measures to reduce crime. Okay, so when, when we're saying that, how does that affect straw purchases? Well, straw purchases have always been illegal uh, on a federal level and on a state level, they're illegal. And a straw purchase is essentially someone purchasing a firearm for someone other than themselves. And there's a, a form that you fill out, what's called a 4473, it's a federal form, and there's a question on there, are you buying this gun for yourself? If you answer no, that you're buying for somewhere else, you're not allowed to purchase a firearm. So you've actually committed a federal offense and a state offense. So the straw purchase is illegal, we but who actually answers no? That's just it. The people, they lie about it. Right. Uh, fortunately, in this state, we have many, many small gun shops. They're not large, major operations, with the exceptions of one major store in uh, Newark. 
And they do a very good job of screening the people that are trying to purchase a firearm. So the straw purchases are not as frequent as some people are led to believe. And the gun owners not wanting to lose their license to do business are very, very uh, observational on what they're going to do. And they do take steps to keep people from buying a farm. And if they have any suspicions, they tell the person no sale. Yeah. So straw purchases are, can be a problem. Um, we don't believe that this will reduce straw purchases in any way, shape, or form. The biggest problem we see with firearm violence is people that steal the firearms. Uh, there are people that purchase them legally and then turn around and sell them to people illegally. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also such a thing as a community gun, which is used by many people. It's stored or possessed by somebody. In these zip codes that are surrounding us now. Yes, that's one of the most prominent things that we find through talking to the various law enforcement agencies that community guns are a problem. Uh, there's instances where there's been seven or eight offenses committed with one firearm. That cross not only the Wilmington line, but the, that community gun goes into Philadelphia and then back to Wilmington, and we've seen that yeah, recently. Yeah, that goes along with, the, with the, the way that they conduct business. And this won't stop, this bill will not stop that process. Okay. Ma'am, there's also some social issues that go along with this as well, and you'd like to talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. When you think about another bill, right, another law, it really affects law-abiding citizens. These issues that we're talking about in the streets are being done by criminals. Those of us that follow the law are law-abiding citizens. If they were going to be law-abiding citizens, they wouldn't be criminals anyway. So you really just continue to burden those who want to live up to the standard. We all want safer communities. We all want safer schools. Me being a law-abiding citizen feels the exact same way. And this bill doesn't do anything but hinder that. All right, does it hinder any specific groups? It's out, absolutely, it's going to hinder those who are in poverty, specifically in inner cities, um, those who are less fortunate, specifically black and brown communities. These laws are racist, and they will always be subjective to those who are looking to come after us. So is it the particular gun owner in those communities that's making a decision, or is it the legislation itself that's causing this divide, or, or I guess, the hindrance of people of color to obtain licenses? It would be the law, it would be the uh, legislators, right? Yeah. I don't know the last time that any of them came out and asked us questions. When is the last time they were willing to sit down at the table and talk to any of us about how we can do this together? They're just not interested. Hmm. So what are some vital statistics that you're finding or, or, or the trend that you're finding um, in regards to minorities and gun ownership? Well, what we're seeing um, both at the local and national level is that when these laws go into place, it really turns over um, the ability for us to manage our own households. Mm -hmm. So then you have police officers who we've seen day in and day out use their authority against us as citizens, right? Because this law would then say, if anyone in my house got in trouble, my firearms would be at risk of being taken as well. So it does create a registry on the back end, really affecting black and brown communities all up and down the state lines. So if you had your druthers, and basically this is your opportunity to do so, and you had to speak to the legislators that were passing this legislation, that are pushing it along, that are just gung-ho for it, what would you say to them? Well, to piggyback off of what Shania said, the object is not the problem, it's the people. In 2016, the city of Wilmington conducted or uh, requested a study by the CDC, and they came up with 20-some recommendations that none of them involved firearms about how to reduce violent crime in the city of Wilmington. None of those recommendations have ever been implemented by the state legislature. The city of Wilmington hasn't gone to the state legislature to request funding or help in doing this. Um, most of the violent crime in the United States, and even in Delaware, 80% or better, is in urban areas. It also involves gangs and drugs. So until you get a, a, a manage the, the way to reduce the number of people, gangs and drugs, and they're doing their, you know, their business, you're going to have illegal use of firearms. So you need to de deal on an everyday basis with education, families, um, get people off of drugs, 
deal with those issues, and I think you'll see a reduction in violent crime. Until you do, you're not going to see a reduction because these bills do not address violent crime. They only address law-abiding citizens. So to, to that point, violent crime needs to be curbed. I'm not against that at all. But those violent crimes that use firearms, right, not all violent crime is firearm violent crime, right? Um, would this legislation make it harder for people who resell guns, right? So someone legally purchases a firearm and then illegally sells that firearm. Would this legislation that's being proposed, and I think it would, begin to slow that down? We don't believe so, because most of the fire, gun crimes, most of the gun uh, that are used in crime are stolen. Mm -hmm. uh, they are brought in from other states. Not that it's a trafficking thing, but mm -hmm. the, they're also one gun used in many crimes. Um, the biggest thing is they're stolen. They're stolen from people in burglaries. Uh, there are people that legally purchase firearms that turn around and, like we said earlier, rent them mm -hmm. uh, and sell them to other people and then go back and buy another one. So there is that business of dealing in, in guns illegally. Uh, this won't stop that. I just would, I'm sorry to cut you off. I would just pose the question back, right? Mm -hmm. that if you go through the process of a permit to purchase, you're saying to the everyday citizen, you have a need a desire, a want, which is your Second Amendment right, to go buy a firearm. You now have a process. You have to go through all of these things. Regardless of your intent, the process will not change the person that you are. So if you were planning to become a criminal because you were going to sell it illegally, because you were going to resell it, because you were going to give it away or loan it out, the process didn't change. But it, it just made it hindrance. really difficult. Right. It becomes a hindrance to its difficulty. Yes, but if I'm going to be a criminal, we all know that there's somewhere in the city that you could go buy a gun illegally. Mm -hmm. Those places exist. I don't know where they are because I happen to be a law-abiding citizen who has the right to walk into any legal FFL and purchase a firearm. But that doesn't change the criminal. Until we address the criminals and the issues that are happening in this state, this, this bill and no other bill is ever going to change that situation. So let's, let's spin it and say someone that's having a, a mental event or a domestic violence, right? Which is in itself a, a mental event that someone is experiencing with their families. And they make a rash decision to go out and purchase a handgun to do the unthinkable. Does this legislation slow that down in any way and give that person enough time to either calm down and think or the necessary background checks available, making them available in order to ensure that that person is one that needs to own a, a firearm? I would still say no, because the flip side to that is, what if I'm in dire need of protecting myself or my family? What if I know that there is a person that is after me? What if I've been in a domestic violence situation and I need to protect myself? You're now putting a process in place specifically for that woman who has a desire and a need to protect herself, slowing down that process. Well, it sounds like, isn't that what law enforcement is supposed to do? Right, but the average response time in Delaware is still over seven minutes. Right. And all they're gonna do is show up and take a report. So how do I protect myself if you now want me to be delayed? in possibly getting that permit. And to, to back that up, if you look at Maryland, has had a permit to purchase program since 2013. How does, how does the permit to purchase accomplish what you are alluding to, and you still have the murder rates you have in Baltimore, which have gone up every year, with the exception that the year after it was introduced and implemented, every year since then, the murder rate in Baltimore is going up, and violent crime is going up in Baltimore. This is true in New Jersey, Illinois has a permitting system, look at Chicago. So these permitting systems don't deal with the criminal. They only deal with the law-abiding citizen. Um, the other thing is studies have shown, and the most recent is RAND, which is a very prestigious research group, that there's no correlation between persons committing suicide with a firearm and the ability to purchase it without a delay. There's also no correlation in violent crime and murder rates by delaying somebody the, the right to buy a firearm uh, for any period of time. And over the years, waiting periods have been attempted in many places and have been shown not to have any effect whatsoever on those things. So statistically, um, it doesn't have an impact that they desire th to have and that it won't reduce suicides and it won't reduce violent crime. It just impacts law-abiding citizens. 
again, my firm belief is you need to deal with the person itself, not the object. Right. So to that, I would say a couple different questions or, or points. One is I, I love the RAND Corporation and, and have participated in studies with them in the past. But in regards to people that are going through mental distress, how many of those persons are actually spoken to after their mental distress rather than seeing the cause of what they have done? So you go there, you've talked yourself out of it, and you've walked away and you've gone home because of the, I guess, the time that's there uh, for the permit to purchase. We don't interview those people, right? So statistically, it's, it's null. There's, it's been skewed. Um, but also, I understand that we cannot Second Amendment is something that, that I firmly stand behind. I think that it does um, a lot for us as a people and separates us uh, from other countries, right? Um, and, and I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. But I also believe that we are a country of, of rules and standards, right? There's a reason why there's red lights. I'm not, Newcastle County has plenty of them, and, and I would like to discuss that point. Uh, but, uh, but I also understand its need. I understand the need for firearms in our country. I think um, I wish that I had the acuity of a sportsman such as yourself and could you know, hit a target from 1,000 yards. I think that's amazing, and, and I'm glad that you do it. But I also understand that they are uh, tools or objects, as you're, as you're mentioning, um, that do heinous things in this country. And I believe that we do need some laws and standards. Now, what can we do to ensure that we're meeting those standards? What, what, what would be the solution in your eyes? I don't think there's any one solution. It's, mm. it's, you know, there's a myriad of problems in society in general. And you have to deal with the whole person. You have to deal with the whole community. Yes, there are laws and rules about firearms. They've been in place for many years. But there's also something that has to be considered other countries don't have and that this is a constitutional right so everything that's done has to be done in the light of this is a constitutional right that back in 1791 and 92 when the bill of rights is being developed the first 10 amendments were developed to keep government out of our business they were rights that were deemed to be something that government could not infringe upon so the government didn't grant us these rights. Th these laws need to be looked at in that context. So how do you reconcile the constitutional right with solving society's ills? I believe we need more minimum mandatory sentences for people that use firearms illegally. There's a case in Sussex County last year that uh, a lady bought nine firearms through a straw purchase. She was very good at what she did, good actress. Gave it to her boyfriend. She was finally arrested by the Attorney General's office. She got probation. Mm. That doesn't send the right message. People that are involved in firearm violence need to be accountable for their actions. I believe they need to be imprisoned. I don't know of a, a criminal in prison that it comes out and that, uh, that's in there that hurts somebody on the street. They're, they're out of the circulation for a while. Let's do programs to help them you know, acclimate back into society. There has to be accountability for crime. And I think some things have turned around lately where you can get probation for a firearms violation. That doesn't send the right message. 80% mm -hmm. um, of all gun crimes are plea bargained down or away. Now, the Attorney General's office says that that's part of a process where they get the person to plead to a, a higher offense. Not in all cases. There's too many deals made where the firearm offense is, go, is done away with. So the person may not become a person prohibited, mm -hmm. which could be a problem down the road. So accountability for people's actions is part of it. Education is part of it. Um, the drug problem is a big part of it. The gang problem is a big part of it. So you have to treat the, the community as a whole. And that's what the CDC report said in 2016. Treat the community as a whole. It's not just one thing that's going to solve these problems anywhere in the state or the country. So I'm hearing a holistic approach from Mr. Haig. Ms. Daniels, I'm saying uh, Mr. Haig brought up a very good point about the uh, first 10 articles of the Constitution and that the Second Amendment was there to ensure that those articles were actually taking place. But in fact, as you and I know, that when these articles were drafted, we were not in mind, right? We, we being African, African Americans. Americans were not caught in mind of that. Right. And, Actually, uh, so much of that was used to 
quote unquote, keep us in our place, right? Mm -hmm. And to ensure that things weren't getting out of hand because at that time we were considered property. So as we're moving forward now, we're trying to, I don't want to say gain our rights, right? Or regain our rights. They've been given to us as Americans. I understand what you're saying is, hey, well, these laws that are being presented in State Bill 02 could possibly hinder us even more from the ownership of weapons and us accepting our Second Amendment right and having or giving the ability so uh, to purchase. So asking if you had your druthers, what does legislation perfection look like in regards to uh, obtaining a firearm in the United States? I mean, the bottom line is this, it has to start with conversation, right? It has to start with the holistic approach. If we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, somebody needs to address mental health, right? We all need to talk about the environments that we're growing up in, the environments that we're raising our children in. Is education sufficient in Delaware? Are we having conversations around gun safety? And at the end of the day, are we prepared to really put this law in place and it not hinder specific groups of people? I don't think there's enough legislation to be able to do that, right? We really need to be able to sit at the table, all of us, everybody having a seat together to say, here's the big problem, and how do we together find a solution? Okay. I'm hearing the philosophy, but I'm not hearing the legislation. Are we, can, what type of background checks are we saying? Well, are we, we already have background checks in Delaware. You can't walk into an tell FFL me, and tell buy me, a gun. Tell me more about our background checks here in the state. So you're gonna walk into an FFL today, An right FFL now. is? a legal gun store that would allow you to purchase a firearm. Okay. You're going to walk into one of those chosen stores today. There's several of them in the state of Delaware. They're going to ask you for your ID. You're going to fill out a federal form. There's some questions on there that only you can answer. No one in the store is going to help you. And then you're going to wait for them to do a background check. And lots of times that's going to take anywhere from 10 to 15 or 20 or so minutes. And then it'll come back and tell you if you're approved based on the information in your background. So some may say that's too light. Well, no, it's not because the federal background check has been around uh, for many years and is required. <clears throat> Excuse me, the state of Delaware, we passed legislation last year to improve that background check system. It's called FTAP, Federal uh, Farms Transfer Approval Process. What that does is make the state of Delaware the point of checking all the records. So not only are the federal records databases checked for whether or not you're prohibited from buying a firearm, but also all state databases that the State Bureau of Identification has access to, they're checked. And that can be done instantaneously. It's, it's, it's all done computerized now. Arrest reports, incident reports, court documents, dispositions on PF protection from abuse orders, uh, mental health, dispositions all have to be entered within 72 hours in, under Delaware's rules. All those databases can be checked instantaneously against the person to see, are you prohibited? Are you, should you, do you have an outstanding warrant? Um, should you be allowed to buy the firearm? Yes or no? And that's all gonna be done instantaneously. And we already have places that have the ability to delay you. So if there's a question or there's some suspicion, they can delay you on site and say, follow up with me in three days, or give the office a call in three days, or here's a number for you to call if I'm not sure what this really means. So there's already a delay in place for those suspicious of other activities. So it, it, again, is that too much legislation right now? I, I know some people that are proponents of the Second Amendment to the fullest extent, I would say, say we don't need any of that. Is no, that, I disagree. You disagree with that? I would disagree too, right? I do believe that we need some structure in the ability to purchase firearms, but I do not need Big Brother or Uncle Sam monitoring how many firearms are in my house, right? And what I'm going to do with them, assuming I am a law-abiding citizen. Hmm. If so I, if I quantity. Could, if I could just go back a minute, you talked about um, you know, African-Americans regaining their rights. That was one of the primary reasons of the 14th Amendment in 1863 and 4 was because African-Americans were not being able to purchase or own firearms in many of the southern states. That was one of the primary reasons for that amendment. That amendment has been applied to the states. And when it comes to the Second Amendment, 
the 14th Amendment through the uh, McDonald case versus Chicago, the U.S. Supreme Court said that amendment applies to the state. So therefore, this is going backwards because as we talked earlier, this is impacting disproportionately communities of color. I don't think we need to go backwards. I think we need to go forwards and work together to come up with a solution with the legislators, community leaders, and everybody else. I love it. Last minute, tell me, what would you tell to the legislators right now that are uh, behind this legislation? There's a better way of spending $20 million. There's many other programs that can be done. Let's work together like we've done before with red flag laws, the background checks, and come up with a solution that works, not a knee-jerk reaction and have something that doesn't, that's very expensive, and is not going to be implemented for about two years. Ms. Daniels? I would agree that take that same money and put resources back in communities that need them. Whether it's our education system or creating more jobs in communities, we do have to do this as a whole approach. As promised, you've heard it right here on DETV's The Agenda. We've ensured that your rights are being discussed and the legislation is being passed and ensuring that it is on your agenda. So we look forward to seeing you right here next week on The Agenda.